Hello, and welcome back to the Irish Tennis Updates podcast. And welcome to episode two of the new series on the history of Irish tennis with author Tom Higgins. If you haven't listened to episode one yet, I would encourage you to do that and then come back and listen to episode two. Before we get into this episode, a reminder that you can buy Tom's book, The History of Irish Tennis. And for further details, you can email Tom at higgins.tom at itsaligo.ie. And I've left that email address down in the description as well. The theme for this week's episode is the golden era of Irish tennis and the success of the Irish players at the majors. And to kick off this week's episode, we have a question from Mark Finnegan of All Sports Recruitment. Here is Mark's question. What years have been the most successful years for Irish performance tennis and the overall tennis environment in Ireland? The answer to that question is probably 1890 being the best year and the decade or so coming after that definitely counts as the golden era of Irish tennis and the best years for Irish success. Now I will pass you over to Tom Higgins to explain more. Here's Tom. So Swillian Club ran the Irish Tennis Championships very successfully from 1879 and Devere Gould, who we mentioned in the last podcast, was the inaugural winner. And you move on a couple of years and there's a gradual build-up of, of talent in the country. And uh, one of the first people who was fairly successful is a fellow called Ernest de Sillel Hamill Brown was his name. He was a member of Fitzwilliam as well. Okay. He was one of the early successes. And in 1884, he actually got to the quarterfinals of Wimbledon singles and then the semifinals the following year. And he won the Scottish Championships in 1889, 1890, 1891, and the Welsh Championships in 1886 and 1887. So he was a useful player, but he was actually known for uh, his success in doubles. Now, at that time, Ireland started building up more and more tournaments. And by 1909, there were 27 tournaments around the country. The Irish Lawn Tennis Association had been founded in 1908. But parallel to that, in, in the UK, uh, Wales, Scotland, England, the growth was huge in terms of tennis clubs. But in England, there was a huge number of tournaments and a lot of Irish players actually went over and played there. Brown was one of the first after Gould. And then you had Mail and Grish, who is a player from uh, Kilkenny. Her seven her sister did very well. Uh, Beatrice and uh, Mail and Grish you now it was became the first women's championship anywhere by winning the Irish uh, singles championship in 1879. It's the first ladies championship recognised internationally. But she, she actually went along and won the Irish championship, and she she won it in 1886, and then she won a number of doubles and the Irish doubles championship with her sister Beatrice in 1883. So she'd have been sort of one of the, the early ladies. Brings us, I'm, going, I'm diving straight into 1890. Lena, Lena Rice from Tipperary, and she was one of eight children. And they played tennis at their home court. And she also played a number of miles away at Care Lawn Tennis Club. Now, she'd only about two or three competitive seasons. But her claim to fame is that she was runner up in the Wimbledon Championships in 1889 and then won it the following year. That 1890 was, was an interesting one because at Wimbledon in 1890, there were only men's singles, men's doubles and ladies singles. And all three titles were won by Irish players, which is a fairly key oh, yeah. point. So from the late 1880s up to about 1900 uh, or 1902, that period of 10 or more years was considered the golden age of Irish tennis because of the successes everywhere. Now, I don't want to forget another woman, Louisa Martin. Now, Louisa Martin, her first success was probably being runner-up in the Irish Ladies Singles in 1885, and she was runner-up the following year. And then she won it in 1891, 92, 96, 98, 99, 1900, 1902, 1903. She won the Irish Championships quite a lot. This lady, she was multi-talented. As far as I can find out, 
the Irish Ladies Hockey Union started in 1894 and she became one of the stars of the team. And in the first in hockey international, she was the goalkeeper, I think, and they beat England. And a friend of hers, Florence Stanwell, Stanwell was also a tennis player. Okay. And Florence was honorary secretary of the Ladies Hockey Union as they started. And both of them became president of the Ladies Hockey Union. So they were well into hockey. That was in the winter. In the winter, in the summer, obviously, it was tennis. And Florence, in fact, a doubles expert, four years in a row, she had won the Irish champ championships. Louisa Martin was exceptional. She was unfortunate not to win Wimbledon. She was runner-up in the All Comers in 1898, 1900, and 1901. So I better explain this term, all comers. In the early years of tennis, and it varied depending on where you were playing the tennis, there was a thing called an all comers final. So everybody entered, they played, and they got a final. But the winner then had to play in the challenge round against the winner from the previous year. That applied to an awful lot of events for about 20 or 30 years since when tennis started, and then it was dropped. Uh, now, we're talking about golden age of Irish tennis and 1890 was a key one but uh, if we look at three men one was a fellow called Harold Sigerson Mahoney he was born in Edinburgh but they actually it was a, a Kerry family and he was always considered himself Irish and played on the Irish tennis team but he was unfortunately he actually died as a, at 38 year, years of age falling off his bike at the bottom of a hill in Kerry he, was, he went to Trinity College and was a gold medal scholar and was known to be a witty talker and an accomplished musician. So he's a bit of an all-rounder. And during the summer, each summer, he kept a house, obviously the family wants to be well-to-do, but he kept a house at Errol's Court in London and he played in Wimbledon and he played also in the, the London Grass Championships, which were a queen, the Queen's Club, and he did quite well there. Now, some of the quotes about him were, one was, his looks and charm was much sought after by the ladies looking for coaching. So he regularly had different ladies in the mixed doubles because they were, yeah, yeah. They were a keen on. And another one described him as, he was the most generous-hearted, casual, irresponsible, 75 inches of Irish bone and muscle that ever walked on court. So he was actually six, he was six foot three. So he was a big, tall, good-looking fella. Yeah. And... He played in Wimbledon for 14 years between 1890 and 1904. And he was in the semi final or better nine times. Now, that's from an Irish point of view, that's, that was an exceptional record. He won, he won Wimbledon in 1896. And in that final, he beat a fellow called Wilfred Badley, who had won Wimbledon for a couple of years. In the final that he beat him, was the score was six two six eight five seven eight six six three, and it became the longest match on record until nineteen fifty four. He won the Irish singles in eighteen ninety eight, beating one of the Doherty's in the final, the, an English player. And another achievement of his was in nineteen hundred in Paris, he won three medals at the second Olympics. And in eighteen ninety eight, in the German championships. He actually met Joshua Pym, the famous Dr. Joshua Pym from Ireland, uh, from Bray, and beat him in the German final. So this fellow Mahoney had a, had a good pedigree. Now so Pym was born in Bray and he became a doctor and he played for a number of years very successfully. But he used to go into Lansdowne and he was coached by uh, a famous player I mentioned last at the last podcast, uh, Thomas Burke. And he was very, very successful. He as because of a doctor, he eventually retired from tennis. And for some peculiar reason, he was selected to play in the Davis Cup long after he was at his best in 1902, when Great Britain and Ireland, which is the British team really, went over and played in America. And he, he really shouldn't have been selected at that stage. He, was, he hadn't been playing much. But anyway, some of his um, fees, if you like, he was described as being an adventurous competitor regarded by contemporary critics as one of the great geniuses of early tennis. And he was a member of Lansdowne. And he first played in a tournament at 16 years of age in 1885. At the age of 19, he took the current 
Wimbledon champion to fight a fellow called Herbert Lawford. He took him to five sets. So he, he was shown early promises at that age. He himself, his first outing was at Wimbledon in 1890. We got to the semi-final and he was beaten by Willoughby Hamilton, a fellow I actually mentioned earlier on in the semi-final. But himself and a fellow called Frank Owen Stoker won the doubles. Now, from 1890 to 1895, he won five men's doubles championships at the Irish Championships with Frank Stoker. I'll tell you about Stoker in a minute. And Pym won three Irish Championships and he won two Wimbledon Championships. So 1893 and 1894, a lovely photograph that uh, someone gave it to me at one stage or other of Pym with the Irish Championship Cup and the Wimbledon Cup side by side, taken, at, uh, I think, at the Lansdowne Club because he actually had won the title, two singles, for two years in a row. And at that stage, he was no question about it, uh, the number one player in the world. In terms of ranking, in the early years up to, up, well, well into the 1920s and 30s, the rankings were a very sort of um, fiddly thing in so far as you may have a tennis journalist who is reckoned to be knowledgeable about everything, who ranks players based on their performances. So the ranking issue com comes much later, but nobody would have questioned he was the, the best player in the world. And one of the things that he, the 1999 World of Tennis, he's the only Irish entry in the chapter of all time greats, uh, Dr. Joshua Pym. The one thing he didn't achieve years later was uh, to be honoured by being included in the International Hall of Fame, which is actually based in America. Now, that Hall of Fame was an, an American thing for a good while. Then they brought in players from other countries. He should have been included in that, in my opinion. One, Ir one Irish player did. I'll come to her in, in a little while. Yeah. Uh, so that was Pim. There's one other fellow I mentioned very briefly, a fellow called Manliff Goodbody. Now, Manliff Goodbody was a good tennis player, and he's sometimes forgotten because he, he was around at the time that, that there was Hamilton, Pim, and Mahoney. And he, he, he lost a lot of the limelight, but he played in an awful lot of tournaments and, and did very well. And when he was a student, talk about Trinity College, when he was a student at Trinity College in the Trinity College Championships, which would, which would have been fairly competitive at that time, he actually, man of good body, beat Harold Mahoney, subsequent Wimbledon champion, in the 1887 finals at Trinity. Now, good body played in tournaments all over the place. And he got to the quarterfinal of Wimbledon twice, 1889 and 1893. Uh, he won the Irish mixed title, but his big claim to fame was when he went over to America. He went over and played in America in 1894. That year, he went, at that stage, don't forget, there were in, in the American championships, because of travel, very few foreigners would have gone there. And he, he's probably one of the first foreigners to actually play in, in America. He actually got, got to the all-comers final. And on the way, he beat two of the top Americans. So this kind of good buddy was fairly handy. Because, now, talk about the American, the American championships brings me on to something else. When America got all these new tennis sets and started developing it, tennis grew all over America because they had the climate for it. And they literally developed an awful lot of very good players. It was only in the 1910s and, so, and particularly in the 1920s, large number of Americans came over and played, we'll say, in Wimbledon and, and a few of them in the Irish Championships. But we can talk about that some other day. But they felt that their championships were as important as, any, uh, as anybody else. So there's a bit of competition and there was a bit of a challenge match between the, the English, uh, that a small team of English players against American players to see who was the best. And I think, they, I think the Americans won that initial encounter. But uh, they started their first championships in 1881. So don't forget, Wimbledon started in 1877, Ireland is in 1879, and then America, 1881. So they were not far behind. Yeah. And Goodbody was one of a number of Irish players, not a huge number, that went over and uh, tried their hand against the Americans. Now, one player 
I might as well go straight to her that did do well in America was a woman called Mabel Cahill. And Mabel Cahill, she was born in 1863. She was one of 13 children. And her father was a barrister and a landowner in a place called Ballyragget in County Kilkenny. Right. And she is, they think that she started playing tennis on a family court, then moved to Dublin for a while, and then decided to go to America. She joined the New York Tennis Club and in 1890, she entered the American Championships. And reached the all-comers final. Within the couple of years, she had won the American Championships twice, singles. She had won two ladies' doubles championship and three mixed doubles championships. So she was the first person in the world to win singles, doubles and mixed in any of the Grand Slams. And she was included posthumously in the International Hall of Fame in America. She was the, the only Irish person to actually be included in that. That was in 1976 when they opened it up to players from, from other countries other than America. It became an international thing. And she was a bit of a writer as well, and she might have done some acting as well. I think she was a fairly all rounder. Some of the players she was playing against were famous because they were part of the, the, the Roosevelt sisters, President Roosevelt of America. You've heard of them. And there was a, a way back then. The same, that family were a rich American family and okay. she, she beat one of them in one final and one, another one in a semi-final as well. So she, she, she showed her mettle, so to speak, in, in, in how well she did. Now, very, very briefly, back to, back to Ireland, it's a woman called Ruth Dias, D-Y-A-S from Malahide. And she was one of the best tennis players in her, her era. And she eventually married a fellow called Neville do Larcher. Sometimes you see the name Do Larcher in results, and sometimes it's Dias. In 1897, 1899, 1901, 1902, she was runner up on the Irish Singles Championship in each of those years. And in Wimbledon, she was a semi finalist in 1897, a quarter finalist the following year, then runner up in the All Comers, and then a quarter finalist in, 18, in 1902. And then she won the Irish Ladies Doubles for five years and three of the mixed doubles titles as well. So she was a bit of an all-rounder. And one interesting thing about her is she took up golf and then represented Ireland in the seven years between 1902 and 1914. And she was on the team that won the home internationals in Newcastle County down in 1907. There was another famous person on that team as well who I think played tennis. But Ruth, having taken up golf, she succeeded in becoming a winner. The first time, I think the... Ireland won the home internationals for ladies golf, and she was on, on, that, on that team. Now, um, one man I left out earlier on, yeah. I mentioned to you that Joshua Pym from Lansdowne was a very good singles player, but he also won an awful lot of doubles events. And himself, Frank Stoker, his partner, was a big tall fella. Frank Stoker is famous because he was also an international rugby player. And he's a member of Lansdowne Wanderer, Wanderers Rugby Football Club. And his brother, Ernest, was also on rugby team at the same time in 1888. And then he, he took up golf afterwards and became a low handicapper. And his daughter became an international tennis player and hockey player, Norma Stoker. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there was good genes in that particular family. Yes. George Ball Green, I hadn't mentioned him before. He's one of those fellows that gets... Gets hidden away as well. He was runner up in the Irish mixed in 1891. He was runner up in the the German German championships in 1897, and he won the Welsh singles in 1893. But he was no he was known as a doubles player, but he, he did win his singles. And as I said to you, the Irish players went over and played in Germany, part from England, played in Scotland, they played in Wales, and then you've got Mabel Cahill and Man of Goodwill. He went over and played in America. Up, up to this time, nobody had gone as far as Australia. Now, that will come on some other bad podcast where we yeah. talk about the 1910s. For sure. Um, but could you tell me, Tom, a little bit about these, these other international events that I guess became the Grand Slams, but how they would have developed in these early days? The Irish, the English, American, Australian championships were all fairly open. But the French, French would have to be different. <laughs> and they ran the World Hardcore Championships between 1912 and 1923. Now, they, they, they had the Olympics there in, in 1900, but it was only in 1925 that the 
French Open Championships became open. That became the one of the one of the, the, four, the four Grand Slams. The German Championships, 1892, and later on, we had an Irish winner there, Harold Mahoney. He won the singles in 1898, runner-up in 1899, and Joshua Pym was runner-up there as well. Italians, they had their first championships in 1894, and the first Open Championships they had was 1930. So if you like the Germans, the English, the Americans, and uh, we're all, and the Irish, of course, are all the countries that had the main championships in the early days, and then yeah. others gradually came, came in. Now, um, I mentioned very briefly five setters. Poor old ladies were in their long dresses and <laughs> they, were, they were constricted until, until Lottie Dodd and some French players came in and things changed in the 1910s and 1920s. But in the early days, in the from 1892 to 1901, the ladies' singles in America was five sets, the ladies' doubles and the mixed doubles. Ireland never went, our women never went down that for the singles or doubles, but Ireland did have for about 1881 to 1905, the mixed doubles was five setters. Okay. And the Germans, the ladies' singles, five sets in just one year, 1896. I might just ask Tom about the about the tie break because I, I know you mentioned the scoreline earlier that included like a six eight set in in you know, the second or third set. So do you have any idea of when when the tie break was brought in for for the tournament? That's the tie break, or that, that's a, a very recent, relatively speaking. Tie break was initially in 1970 was became an experiment. 1971 was used for the first time at Wimbledon, so it's actually further okay. back than we thought. Okay. And then, obviously, it became international after that. And, um, and just if I could ask another uh, question there, Tom, just um, another point that kind of I was wondering was that you, you mentioned how the different majors came around the French when, when it became open and the, the, the US, I guess, when it became open. But that, that term Grand Slam, do you have any idea when, when that term would have come into use for those four tournaments in particular? Grand Slam came into use in the 1930s, mid, mid-1930s. The initial person, it was allocated to, and it's usually these things, someone in the press decides to call it Grand Slam. Fred Perry, you probably never heard of him, or did you? Fred Perry, I would have heard of him a bit, yeah. You've heard of Fred Perry. But Fred Perry was notable for a couple of things. One is, he was actually world table tennis champion. Number two Mm -hmm. was, he came from a working class background in England, which was not the source of good tennis players. And he went along, of course, and won Wimbledon and he won all sorts of titles. But in the mid 1930s, he had won the French, the English, French Wimbledon and American Championships. And the previous year, I think it was 1934, he actually had won the Australian Championships. And someone decided to call that the Grand Slam because he'd won all four titles. Mm. But the, the real Grand Slam came a couple of years later, 1938, by an American called Don Budge, who was the first person to hold all four titles at the same time. Because Perry had won, he'd won uh, the Australian 34, but by the time in 35 came along and he was winning Wimbledon, Amer- uh, French and the US Championships, they, someone else had won the Australian Championship. But Don Budge then became first holder of that title. And then it, 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 it survived ever since. Okay, okay. Uh, and just one final question that I'd like to, to touch on today, Tom, is, to bring it back briefly to Irish tennis, and I guess it's a tricky question and probably isn't a, there isn't a simple answer to it, but at what point did, did Irish players stop having all the success that you've described that there was? And I guess what, what were a couple of the big reasons that, that would have caused that, do you think? This question also ties in with a question from coach Rob Cherry. Here it is. Hi, Tom. Why did the top tennis players from around the world stop playing tournaments held in Ireland? Now, there's a couple of things that, that happened. One was more and more countries started playing tennis. Number two, we had a small population. Number three, uh, our young people started playing other sports. And some other time we might talk about multi-sports people, but yeah. there would be no other distractions. And we fell behind further in the 1960s when it went professional, because up to that time, the Wimbledon Championships were held after the Irish Championships, Irish, and literally we had the players from America, from Australia and everything like that, coming over and playing the Irish tournament as a build-up to Wimbledon. Yeah. Now that 
that came to a halt subsequently because of finance and the trying to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak, because you had the Queen's Championship in London and, and other tournaments who had bigger funds and were able to attract these players. And when the thing became professional, we lost out and we've never really got back to that high standing. Now, don't forget, they were coming, the Australians and the Americans and the British uh, in the 50s and 60s. There weren't that many Irish players that were getting into finals in those days because uh, our numbers had fallen, fallen behind. Now, I did a study 10 years ago or so and looked at, I was curious about this, I looked at about 50 countries around the world the number of tennis clubs they had, the number of tennis courts they had, and the, and the, and the tennis populations. A brief comparison. I'll pick out a few of them here. Now, I can't. I haven't got the exact year. This was this is about ten years ago. The number of players. Ireland had about forty-one thousand tennis players at that stage. Great Britain, three nearly three million. Germany over two million. France over a million, and and the United States about fourteen million. So when you compare forty thousand with countries having millions of players and more courts and better facilities probably we were up against it and we probably always will be up against it but that does not mean that at some point in time we can't get success i always think the um you, you can occasionally get a player that comes out of the blue and beats the odds so to speak yeah and i, I that, that that can happen but yeah we're, we're, we're competing in a lot of fronts to actually to make it big on the international scene. And that is where we are leaving episode two. I really enjoy getting to hear about the all the Irish success and also some of those other details like tie breaks, grand slams, and women playing five sets as well. So a big thanks to Tom for this episode. And if you did enjoy this episode, please share it around so that as many people as possible can hear about the fascinating history of Irish tennis. Join us again soon for episode three, where myself and Tom will be talking about tennis all-rounders and Irish tennis players who were multi-talented. So do join us again for the next episode. It promises to be really interesting as well. And until then, goodbye.